Decades ago, I started growing food in my front and backyard, and I realized that my mission in life is to inspire and empower others to grow their own nutrient-dense, healthy, organic food. Because of this, a lot of people have come to me with their gardening questions over the years, and that got me thinking, what if we put together a community that would help budding gardeners blossom? So I finally made the idea a reality with my Urban Farm U member program. Each month, your membership includes three live online events, a monthly class, a chit chat with an expert, and a monthly coaching session, plus access to the experts on our member page and a significant discount on our signature courses. I'm deeply committed to transforming our global food system, and I do this by empowering you to grow your own food. The Urban Farm Membership Program is a simple way to get going. Please join me in transforming your food system today. To learn more, go to urbanfarmmembership.org or text MEMBERSHIP to 33444. That's urbanfarmmembership.org or text MEMBERSHIP to 33444. You're listening to the Urban Farm Podcast, your partner in the Grow Your Own Food revolution. Whether you've just been introduced to urban farming or you're a lifelong advocate, we're sure you'll leave feeling more informed, equipped, and empowered to dig deeper into the soil of your local food economy. With you every step of the way, here's your host, Greg Peterson. Today on the Urban Farm Podcast, we have Matt Powers to talk about his experience with permaculture and regenerative living. Matt is an experienced teacher, family guy, author, consultant, farmer, seed saver, plant breeder, musician, blogger, and permaculturist. He frequently speaks at conferences, colleges, schools, and events about permaculture and education. Applying his years of working as a teacher, writing curriculum from scratch, using online classrooms, Matt has opened an online program to accompany his textbook series, The Permaculture Student. Focusing on starting resilient small businesses and homesteads from scratch, students of all ages and families learn through weekly collections of videos, worksheets, coloring pages, projects, activities, and critical thinking with teacher's guides, recipes, plant focus, seed saving, and Q&A. Welcome to the show today, Matt. Hey, how's it going? Thanks for having me. Oh my gosh. I am excited to chat with you. So I shared a bit about you. Can you fill in the blanks for us and share more about the path you took to get where you're at now? Well, I have kind of like a crooked path. Um, It really starts with realizing that the story of the world that I grew up understanding and believing in wasn't exactly real. (laughs) And uh, I kind of – my wife got cancer. Oh. I was a professional musician uh, touring the country with uh-huh. John Cusimano, which is Rachel Ray's husband. We were following her on our $40 days all over the country mm-hmm. and just touring and just having fun eating. And everything with my life was very simple. I was a bass player, just rock and roll man kind of thing. Mm-hmm. And my wife getting cancer kind of like put the brakes on a lot of things and then all of a sudden when we did what they said to do and then three months later she got cancer again and then they started contradict the doctors all started contradicting themselves Mm -hmm. and then i started applying all the education that i had gotten and skills that i had uh you know i'd been given throughout my education Mm -hmm. to this problem of health and my wife and why and understand what was going on I started questioning everything and studying everything I could at the highest level and depth of my comprehension. And so I became, I stopped touring. I, I, I moved to the West Coast first. I started, I still played music down in uh-huh. LA. And then I segued into becoming a, a school teacher so I could be close to home and take care of my wife and, and sons who we homeschool. Mm-hmm. And when that happened, I realized that I needed healthy food. And as I was researching what healthy food actually meant, I came to this whole realization that organic is not trustworthy. Mm. Um, it's, it's more trustworthy. Much, much, much more because you actually know that they are, are what they're legally required and, you know what I mean, to yeah, do. Yeah, exactly. But, but 
for my wife, who had had cancer two times at that point, she had, she would have it again the third time. Mm-hmm. At that point, we 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 realized that, and we also visited farms, and then we started like um, studying like Carol Depp's way of farming, oh, like yeah. a gardener. Mm-hmm. So I started like learning about genetics, and then all the high school science stuff that I had been studying started going under the microscope and being like oh <laughs> Mendel's law of inheritance isn't real be, uh, universally so right uh, it's, it sure is for peas but that's one ploidy that doesn't represent you know like uh, lots of different um, forms of genetic reproduction right so it just it, it started peeling all these layers off and then I started stumbling upon this thing where, because all right, so I had I, I don't know where where everyone in the audience is growing, but I grow on the central the edges of the Central Valley and the foothills facing the Pacific. It's 140 degrees Fahrenheit, two inches deep in bare soil in my area. Wow. When it's 108 degrees out. Wow. And so, and I'm dry farming in that too. Wow. I, I, I have watered areas and whatnot, and I have semi-watered areas, and then I have areas that are completely dry. Mm-hmm. So, <laughs> I'm 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 growing in that. And that's my that's my environment. And so I had to, I I had to realize, or I had to figure out how to work in that environment and grow food. And everyone on here like is like, you can't grow you can't food. Do it, yeah. You can't do it. You can't so, garden. So what is the what is one thing that you did in the space of that to help you grow food? Well, everything's holistic. So let me talk about one whole on of what I did. Okay. So putting things on my 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 paths on contour, so swales. Yep. So that water, when it came, and when I watered, would seep in so, and not run down in the road. So tell that people was, tell people what on contour means, just uh, so that uh, everybody knows. Totally. You got everyone remember remember geology class, and then you had the topographic maps, and they're all the squiggly lines, and they tell you each each line is a different elevation. If you mm-hmm. walk along one of those lines, it is perfectly flat, like you're at the elevator, at, like you know the the elevator escalator walkways. Yeah. It's like that. Perfect. And you could go around the whole landscape like that, and mm-hmm. if you dug a path out that way, it would fill up with water evenly the entire way. So yeah. let's fill up. You know, the entire catchment of the Sierra Nevada is that way, and suddenly you have an entirely huge ecological event happening. So I did that on my property with my beds. My beds were pointed downhill. Oh, Oh my gosh. And so I flipped it once I took Jeff Lawton's permaculture design course online. Yep. And I planted cowpeas, which are awesome biomass, oh awesome my nitrogen gosh. fixer. Yep. And I and I also inoculated it with nitrogen fixing uh, rhizobia, which is a bacteria. And so I got the nitrogen fixation in there. I got the biomass in there. I got the the water infiltration going, and that alone, that alone, was like flipping a light switch on and going from man gardening is got like you got to got to be on top of this to being like this yeah. is easy it became easy wow and it was so encouraging mm-hmm. and so inspiring that cuz you did it you know right. it wasn't like and yeah you heard it from someone sure whatever right but you were the person who yeah. went out there and dug that trench who had the faith that it would work right you threw out the seeds you did it all and then it comes through and the next year you can mm-hmm. stick your yeah, you know where it was bulletproof. You can stick your arm to your shoulder down into soil. Mm-hmm. It becomes this whole different thing. You become oh, yeah. addicted. So that 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 you know that's kind of my story. Is I I found permaculture and it became easy to grow. <laughs> food. And also I got a you know I mean I've got a brick speeder right here to my left, and that was part of my course with Jeff. And so that, you got a a bricks b r i x. A, a refractometer, so yeah, yeah. I can see the mm-hmm. uh, the starch or sugar levels of, of of like plant syrup or juice. Yeah, and that you know to t- test ripeness and all this stuff, but you know stuff like that, just simple stuff that actually allows me to test which is the most nutritious tomato of the organic varieties exactly. at the farmers market. Yeah, stuff like that. You know, right. it just it was and permaculture is encyclopedic at times because it's a lens. Right, all it is. 
is a way of being regenerative. And that means taking care of the planet, taking care of people, and caring for the future. So, and it's, yeah. So do me a favor. For those of our listeners that don't know what permaculture is, can you define it for us? Totally. Permaculture, is, the like official definition is it's a design science um, that uses the patterns of nature to provide beneficially for both people and the ecosystems that we um, rely upon. Beautiful. All life relies upon. Mm -hmm. And it's being regenerative. People talk about being sustainable, all this stuff. Sustainable is like sustaining a note. That doesn't mean you're getting any better. It doesn't right. mean you're repairing anything. You're yes. holding still. Uh -huh. Regenerative means that we're always growing, progressing, adapting. And that's what nature is always doing that. I mean, we're going to have to do that anyway with all this climate change that's coming. Uh, we're only in the beginning. We're 50 years behind climate change. We yeah. feel what happened 50 years ago. Yeah. So, you know, we got to do <laughs> some work here <laughs> in that regard. Oh, yes. So you use the word regenerative multiple times and we used it in your uh, intro. Can you tell us tell us a little bit more about what that means to you? So being regenerative, as I said, it's um, – not it's it's not just not doing damage mm -hmm. it is improving and restoring so when people talk about restorative agriculture they're like well we're going to restore the oaks van like mark shepherd mm -hmm. restoration agriculture wonderful book but that's just restoring it to the way it was and if you actually look at that time period the oak savanna had to be managed by fire and that's why it was an oak savanna because right. There were no large mastodons managing it for us to create the annual perennial cycles. Mm -hmm. Fire was used. By, you know, we, right. we came in absence and did agriculture and fire and all this stuff. There's debate over what whether we hunted them out or climate change or both. It doesn't really matter. <laughs> but like that's 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 what happened. We stepped in with that, and that's what that created that landscape. So I think regenerative is better because it is consistently moving towards a higher expression of biodiversity. Oh, I love the way you said that. I absolutely love the way you said that because uh, I've been struggling with that kind of def to define it. I mean, I know for me, regenerative is like how nature works. And I don't like the word sustainable, but it just simply sustains what we're already doing wrong. But so I, yeah. I, I really love the way you, you defined regenerative. Yay. Yeah, I mean, like, if you look at our political system, people are so upset, but they're, it's a sustainable, like, wrong. And that's what they're doing, is they're sustaining the level of wrong. And they'd be <laughs> that's a good but way you know what it. I mean? It's like oh, we yeah, need yeah. to progress into a better realm. We can't, we can't choose between two evils in our personal lives with our children. You know, we don't, we don't ever make that choice with our children. Yeah. And we need to start. And, and the thing is, we do that with our jobs. Yeah. We need to take and, – and, and it's reflected in the world around us, and we hate that. Good. We got to take that feeling and apply it and then, like, change our lives and then help the neighbors and our families change, change their lives. lives. And then suddenly we change our businesses, and then suddenly it changes the whole local town and then the representatives and then the way we legislate. And then, you know, all so so of it, yeah. it's all connected. So in our, in our pre-conversation, you talked about something called social permaculture. And yeah. I asked you uh, about on your website, which is the permaculture student. You have some translations of your work. I'm about to have some more. Nice. Uh, my first book is uh -huh. largely based off Jeff Lawton's online permaculture design course. There's uh -huh. a little bit of Seth Holzer and Masanobu Fukuoka and stuff like that in there. But mostly it's Jeff and the classic permaculture design. And so – all these people in all these other areas want to be able to take something and mm -hmm. use use a curriculum that goes along with the Jeff Lawn course that they took or something like it, like a classic PDC, because they're right. all very, very similar. Yes. Um, so some of them are specializing now, which is amazing and awesome. Yeah. But I, I, we just translated it. And actually, you know, I should say Jeff and Nadia paid for – well, they raised money. They didn't pay it personally, pay, but they raised money through their foundation to pay for the Arabic translation. Nice. So now, and I've given them full, they have full, uh, full, and that's the cool thing about all this stuff is when we do it for free for each other like yeah. this, we can freely share it. Yeah. So they're going and using it in all their Arabic PDCs. So I want I've you to, 
I want you to share about how you created those because it's so incredibly cool. Oh, thanks. Well, all right. So the reality is I was a school teacher like unlike most school teachers. Uh -huh. Most school teachers have this thing called a pacing guide. Mm. They're required to hit certain standards, use certain materials, and report to a superior. And I was at a charter school. It was still a public school, you know. But I was at a charter school where it was all laptops, and so there was no curriculum. And oh. my supervisors – encouraged me to be really high level and creative and so I got really used to adapting my curriculum a on the fly and then B daily writing new curriculum based upon my kids needs oh. and their interests right. in reflection of all the standards at the same time yeah so it's like I got good at that and I got so good at that that I was speaking at conferences teaching teachers and I have a master's degree in education mm -hmm. And so I applied that to this book, and I, I'm a translator myself. Mm -hmm. I take collegiate level information and translate it down to high school level because I believe oh. that kids that age have the capacity that adults have to understand and operate exactly the same level. Absolutely. And the way we treat them yes. and the educational yeah. path that we prepare yeah. that stymies their growth. Yep. I so agree with you on that. And when you tell children this, no matter what age they are, that you believe that they have a greater capacity, guess what happens? They blossom all that. Oh, they show it. They show <laughs> that they have that capacity. Yeah. And I never know the depth of it, and I never will guess because that's, wow. that, that's you know, I don't have that right. So I'm, I'm, I'm so excited to, you know, I created this curriculum to give back to all those kids because, and I wrote it for homeschoolers, yeah. ideally, so that you don't need a teacher. An eighth grader can pick this up and go, hey, this is cool. Do you need me to help? Yeah, I need these supplies, you know? Yeah. I need these tools, mom. And, or like the, and, and the cool thing is the teacher looks at it and goes, oh, I can teach this so easily. It's not written in, it's not yeah. written in teacher language. And makes it so I have to translate it to the kids. Yeah. So so it's been this huge, huge thing. And because it's written so simply and clearly, mm -hmm. it's been easy to translate. Nice. So in the translation part, I want to go back to you've translated to Polish and Arabic. Yep. And the Spanish um, oh. is already being used in PDCs, but we're tweaking bits still before I release it. Perfect. And then there's Italian and then there's French. Nice. So how did you uh, – I want I really want to get to this because it's so cool. How did you get that done? You called it social permaculture. Tell us about that. Oh, okay. Yeah, so social permaculture is applying regenerative living to um, our relationships. Uh -huh. And, well, that would mean that we would be more ecosystemic. So I in, – in nature, like trees are going to put out exits and signal to nature, hey, I'm sick or, hey, I, I need this kind of uh, bacteria or fungi or all these different things. They're going to send out these chemical, uh, sometimes people think bioelectrical signals. Mm -hmm. And that's what I did through social media. And I, I, I said, I'm looking for volunteer translators. And I'm, the deal I make with them is they get to set the price so that the, the people who um, need it can afford it in their country because I don't know. And they can freely use it. Mm -hmm. So they can go and start teaching with it. They can start sharing it with the teachers in their areas and in their countries. They can um, give it away. They can they can do whatever they want with it. And this doesn't make me money, but this 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 gives me. When I help someone else, I'm I, I'm helping my family. I'm mm -hmm. helping all families. It's all one thing. It's all we're all connected like that. We're all family. Yeah. And so. I truly believe in the third, the third ethic, care of the future, return a surplus, fair share. Yeah. And this is my way of doing that. So, uh, so you, so you went out and found people, basically. Well, yeah, I advertised the... and told them this is my idea. Uh -huh. My idea is that we need to get permaculture everywhere. We need to be having it in schools everywhere. And if we have these translations, it's just going to be easy. And so, all these people in all these countries that have wanted permaculture in yeah. their language are like, oh, we don't have permaculture in Romania mm -hmm. or, or there's only this book or only that book 
and we have nothing for kids. And that was why I did it because there was nothing for kids. Mm, and so yeah. and especially there was nothing in depth for kids. It was yeah. all written for teachers to teach to kids. Mm-hmm. Wow. So did, did it, people respond to when you are willing to include them helping each other and themselves make the world a better place mm-hmm. for the future too. Wow. Cool. So it all becomes a stack triple bottom line thinking and you but you could feel it because <laughs> and if you can even do it and design it in a way that like where I had multiple translators and teams where you do a Google Doc and everyone can see each, each other so there's no competition. Yep. It just kind of takes all those tools away from us. And 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 and, and social permaculture is really us it's really us applying people care to our daily lives and it can look like mother Teresa. it can look mm, like mm-hmm. the guy who stays home and takes care of his mom yeah. or his dad that has alzheimer's or dementia yeah. um, there's this wonderful example pandora thomas she's teaching a social permaculture course mm-hmm. with starhawk in northern california and she takes care of her mom who has alzheimer's and she shapes her whole life around that and that's as much permaculture as gardening is. And she not only does that, I mean, she gar- teaches gardening to people who are being released from prison so that they will have skills. And it, it's so much more than the skills. It, she realized what she was doing, that she was really providing <laughs> this complete other service. Cause A culture you, change. Yeah. yeah. And it, we all need this culture change. I mean, if we mm-hmm. look at the system of the world we have, <laughs> us, no one can argue that it has made the world better in the past hundred years. No, that's true. More famine. There's more slavery. There's more yeah. war. More degradation. Yeah. But there's less violence per person mm. because we're all recognizing that mm. we're family. And so there's this disgust building as the disgusting things build. Yeah. And what it's coming to is a head where we where we come to terms with all this stuff. And I think we're we're getting there. Thank and God. It's <laughs> Thank gosh we're getting there. So you have mentioned a couple of times the permaculture ethics. Would you just review for people uh, that don't okay. know it what the permaculture ethics are? Well, all right. Initially, let's talk about where it all came from. David was a student. David Holmgren was a student at 18 or 17 of Bill Mollison, who was a university professor uh-huh. at a Tasmanian university. Yep. And they were brainstorming this idea of universal theory for everything. A lot of people were working on that idea at the time period. And this was in the early they, 70s? Yeah. Yeah. It, they, they took 20 years to work on this whole stuff. Mm-hmm. But basically, the definition of the third ethic, they arrived at three ethics by examining the longest lasting cultures um, in, in, in human history. Uh-huh. And they all had care of people, care of, of, care of the planet and the care of the earth and care of the, of the future is what I say. Uh-huh. But Bill said return of surplus and David said fair share. Mm. And people will have problems with those and that's why I use care, uh, care of the future because the, the return of surplus is too economic. The fair share is too political because uh-huh. people read socialism in that. Yep. And the care of the future, it's a Native American Iroquois idea. It's just like the whole Japanese business plan idea where you look 100 years into the future. Yep. And so you look seven, genera- seven generations into the yeah, future. Exactly. So this care of the future ethic, not just that process of looking to the future seven years uh, or seven generations. This ethic of caring for the future encompasses returning surplus, mm-hmm. sh- having people have fair share. And even more different, more abstract and specific examples that are hard to fit into that return of surplus. Are you returning surplus when you um, go and visit your grandma? That seems kind of weird to take something personal and say surplus. Well, that could be the social permaculture part of it, right? Right. But if it's care of the future, you're really showing your gratitude for the past. And when you do that, you carry with you uh, the seeds for your own carrying, caring in your old age. Yeah. Like, for instance, it's really sad. There's an entire generation of baby boomers that put their parents in homes mm-hmm. 
and are preparing themselves to go into homes and they're privately dealing with horror because they saw what happened to their parents mm -hmm. and how miserable their parents were and the I mean we all want to be with our family at the end of our lives yeah and we need to exemplify that if we want that to be our lives and it, and it it's that whole care of the, it's that whole tied holistic thing where it's like um, what you want is what you give and in, in what you get yeah. you know yeah so so if you want to be that if you want to receive that you got to give it <laughs> so you and it, it kind of what you've done with all of this information that you've created over the past decade or however long you've been working on it is you've created a curriculum an online curriculum for people yes yeah, so I've been I've been gardening for eight years. Mm -hmm. uh, I've been doing educational stuff. I started writing uh, actual educational curriculum. Believe it or not, I wrote a visual music theory book for both guitar and bass ten years ago. Oh wow, cool. Yeah, and so I've been into education and into explaining things so that people who are with learning disabilities um, and of uh, different learning modalities can grasp difficult concepts so that I've had that's probably my most enduring pattern in this whole thing is that I work to help people that don't understand understand mm -hmm. and it's my and, and, and it's my service nice. uh, that's what I do and that's what I do is my service perfect so tell us about your online curriculum hmm okay so this is really fun. So I got to blend all the things that I wanted to do in public ed and couldn't do into one online course. And so it's really is holistic permaculture. Mm -hmm. And most people don't get this stuff at a PDC. It's not as long as a PDC. It's only uh, 16 and a half hours. Uh -huh. But it's condensed so that it's more efficient. Uh, and, uh, and it could have been longer, but I condensed a lot of it to be more efficient so that you spend – less time watching more time doing but there's cooking i have recipes i have thematic it's like we're going to be doing bread this week or mm -hmm. we're going to be mm -hmm. doing fermentation this week or preservation and and i go through cooking i go through from seed to table to preservation to you know what i mean i take the gardening into entrepreneurship i take all these different connections. We do animal husbandry. Mm -hmm. um, I don't do uh, like animal slaughter on there because, you know, not everyone's interested in that. Uh, yeah. And there's better, you know, there's tons of videos out on that. Yeah. I, I stick to the things that empower people to make life easier uh, for themselves. And it also is around the format of what um, a regular PDC is. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, say, with, say, what, say what that is actually, would you? Because there's people that may not know what okay, PDC so, is. Okay. A permaculture design course, uh, the official one is like 72 hours long, mm -hmm. and it goes through um, the ethics, and it goes through the concepts uh, and themes and design. It goes through patterns, soils, trees, mm -hmm. water, earthworks, aquaponic or uh, aquaculture, Aquacul climates, like the different uh, climates. And when they break down the climates, they do it in um, in terms of like housing like farming broad acre and then food forestry and then gardening. So it's, really and, a, it's really a 72 hour exploration of what permaculture is. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And, it, and, it, and, and that that's, that's, and then there's the last bit, which is social permaculture and it's usually not very much on it, but the reality is it's been all around us always. Yeah. Permaculture, the idea of taking care of the future, the people, and the earth, <laughs> you know, people in the earth fall right into care of the future if you're mm -hmm. aware of. So these concepts are ancient. There, we lived at a time period where humans didn't understand anything but that because they're like, in order to survive, we need to respect the earth around us um, because we live by, you know, uh, the bounty we receive from the earth. You know right. what I mean? Uh, and so we were very connected with that concept. It is only uh, in the past, you know, 100, 150 years that most people are disconnected with that. Yeah. 
Yeah, and I, I know for me, permaculture helps me get reconnected back into that flow. Yeah, and and it also frees us from um, the guilt because all mm, uh, mm -hmm. because I mean, realistically, we, we America has to come to terms with the fact that social scientists have calculated that uh, there's a, we we each individual, the average American has about eighty ghost slaves, the equivalent of a slave in other countries doing the labor in order to make our clothing. Yeah. Um, and it's be, and the reason it's slavery is because they're being paid less than living wages and they're trying to live on it and they're living in – it's like squalor conditions and they can't escape those areas. They're being held in those areas. Uh -huh. And so it's – they're being incarcerated mm. in those areas and required to live in – you know what I mean? Yeah. And so it qualifies uh, to the social scientists doing this study and it's painful – but if we examine where the minerals come from, if we look it in the face and we're like, can you actually build this printer? Can you drill and get the oil and then dig up the ore and then refine it all? Or can you stomach walking the, through the steps of that and meeting each of the people and buying it directly from them? Can you stomach that and paying the price you are paying right now at uh -huh. the end? Giving them a couple pennies for the, the – the, the hours of labor that they do in front of you, you'd feel sick. We all would. And the thing is, we know it deep down that something's wrong. We couldn't do this. We can't. We're, we're, we're not capable of this, yeah. doing this all on our own. And so when we start growing our own food, we start getting off the grid with energy and we're like, wow, so we did this once. And it's going to last 20 years. Or we use water power and it will last 100 or 200 or 300. Yeah. And so it's like we're at this cusp moment where people are seeing, realizing that gardening and soil and all these like spiritual things mm -hmm. have serious importance in their life regardless <laughs> of whether you're spiritual or not. Yeah. You will have a spiritual connection to the garden if you do it enough and it doesn't have to be like belief in anything you will right. have a reverence because that's what spirituality is to me is a reverence um for, for the world around you and the people around you yeah you will develop this like respect and reverence for yourself for the garden for nature and and everyone feels that around you and it and it, and it builds and it grows and we could start there that's why it's exciting that you're running this podcast yeah that's a great place to start and a great place to shift so can you talk about a time you failed, how you overcame that failure, and what you might have learned from it? Whew. Well, I failed a lot. <laughs> uh, Welcome to being human, right? I, yeah, and I feel like you know, mistakes are how we learn, and I try to tell my students and my children that. I tried starting a school. That's how I made the online course. Uh huh. Because I, I, and then my whole thing's fail upward. So I, 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 and that's what my talk was at PV2. Yeah, so... I what happened was I started try to start a school in Sebastopol at the Permaculture Skills Center at Eric mm -hmm. Olson's and Lauren Olson's business. Oh yeah. And everyone was gung ho, and I needed 18 uh, people to sign up to make enough money to pay for the rent, and I didn't quite have enough, and that meant I would have to start out going into debt, and oh. I was was like no, no no no. That's not a good business, you know what I mean? Venture to start, uh, you know, in hopes that someone will, four other, five other kids will sign up. And so I was running an Indiegogo and everyone was aware and we didn't make enough money on the Indiegogo to get all the supplies. Mm -hmm. And it was uber painful burn. Like, mm -hmm. you know, it, when you do these things publicly, it can feel like you are being rejected. Oh, yeah. Not that your idea is right. incomplete because it's your, that your idea is incomplete. And especially if you get partially funding, it really tells you that you're on the right path, but you, you haven't gone far enough. And so I circle back and over the course of a weekend, uh, decoping with it, I went silent on, 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 on the in internet. And I came back going from like 24 hours of really, really brooding mm -hmm. to being really excited. 
and I flipped it and I came back and I failed upward publicly and I embraced the failure publicly and I said we're going online we're going to help more people than ever and within a month the course was launched and and, and it was it was just really really wild I basically started the course and had only filmed week one uh-huh. and every week with the class I would film oh, nice. the videos for the next week yeah so it was a whirlwind, and I actually worked every day for three months. And then after that was done, I started working every day for 12 to 18 hours a day on my new book. Oh, congratulations. So what drives you? Well, my, what drives me is that um, I could lose my wife or my children at any point to illness. And I mm. had to deal with that mm. um, and accept that as a reality when my wife got cancer oh, yeah. three times in a row. Yeah, uh, because it's like the first time you're like it'll never happen again. We can get through this, right? And the second time you're like, the world's gone crazy. The third time you're like, I must be able to have some outlook that helps me control myself because I can't control it. Yeah. And so I do it so that my children can have a better life, so that my mm-hmm. children can be healthier. So that my wife and I can be grandparents together, yeah. And that, and so that I can feel clean and look people in the eyes and be completely honest and free. Yeah. Because when I when I have no contradictions, when I know the things that I I'm doing are truly ethical through and through, um, I feel totally free. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. So, what one final piece of advice do you have for our listeners? All right. Yeah. So my final piece of advice is do not be satisfied with what you have. Go out and make the world better. Mm-hmm. Go out and be and, – and, and I mean that even with ourselves. Mm-hmm. It's like, okay, today my energy could be higher. I could be better. This could be better. Let's make it better. If it should be better, if it could be better, mm-hmm. let's make it better. Yeah. So my advice to, to everyone is to embrace that energy and to go out and to do actual actions to make the world a better place because that will make you feel better. Beautiful, 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 beautiful. Well, thanks so much for joining us on the show and sharing your experience with us today, Matt. It has been a treat getting to chat with you. Oh, thank you. I appreciate it. Absolutely. So how can our listeners get a hold of you? And I know you also have a podcast, so I want you to say just a little bit about that too so that if people want to hear more, they can find you there. Awesome. So I'm at Mm thepermaculturestudent.com. That's my website. And then my podcast is permaculture tonight and it's on itunes nice and it's on soundcloud and soon we are going to be on fm radio in san diego so we're really excited about that shift congratulations thanks well fantastic that's it for today thanks for joining us on the urban farm podcast awesome thanks for having me Decades ago, I started growing food in my front and backyard, and I realized that my mission in life is to inspire and empower others to grow their own nutrient-dense, healthy, organic food. Because of this, a lot of people have come to me with their gardening questions over the years, and that got me thinking, what if we put together a community that would help budding gardeners blossom? So I finally made the idea a reality with my Urban Farm U member program. Each month, your membership includes three live online events, a monthly class, a chit-chat with an expert, and a monthly coaching session, plus access to the experts on our member page and a significant discount on our signature courses. I'm deeply committed to transforming our global food system, and I do this by empowering you to grow your own food. The Urban Farm Membership Program is a simple way to get going. Please join me in transforming your food system today. To learn more, go to urbanfarmmembership.org or text membership to 33444. That's urbanfarmmembership.org or text membership to 33444. 
We hope you enjoyed today's episode of the Urban Farm Podcast. Remember to listen three days a week for tips, advice, and resources to help you on your journey with urban farming. You can find us on the web at urbanfarm.org or send us an email to podcast at urbanfarm.org. In the words of Vincent Van Gogh, great things are done by a series of small things brought together. Be encouraged that with each lesson learned and skill developed, you are one step closer in the direction of your dreams.